want to welcome each and every one of you this morning. I'm excited for all the new things that God is doing and going to do in the new season. Amen. I believe that we are coming into a new season of expansion, a new season of increase. Amen. And every time that God is doing something new, we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit about what's happening. Hallelujah. So, which is why physically as well, we're upgrading, we're improving, increasing, uh, believing that God will bless that increase. Amen? Right. In the last few weeks, we've been talking about life in the spirit. Life in the spirit. We saw in John chapter 10, verse 18, that Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life. I take it up again. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down. And we saw that the reason why Jesus had to give his soul as a sacrifice was for the redemption of of our soul. Amen. Can you increase it a little bit? Just a little bit. Sure. Hallelujah. Yeah. Romans chapter 6 verse 10. Let's, today let's open to Romans chapter 6. Let's go to Romans chapter 6, verse 1 onwards. Life in the Spirit. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 onwards. If you're there, say amen. Amen. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in newness of life for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he, li he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. The entrance of your word brings light. Today, as I speak, let it not be me who speaks, but the spirit of my father speaking through me. And take your people to the next level of glory, Lord. Holy Spirit, anoint this word. Anoint each and every one of us. Give us the spirit of revelation and of wisdom. Open the eyes of our understanding, O oh Lord. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that we are dead to sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Before Jesus, there was another law, the law of sin and death that was operating in our life. The law of sin and death still exists. We've got to understand, everything in this world operates through laws. Laws govern the natural and the spiritual. 
If we want to understand life, we have to understand these laws. If you understand the spiritual laws, you can, you can operate in them and you can be successful in whatever you do. You, that's why sometimes some people can be very bad people and good things will happen to them because they understand certain laws. They understand the laws of finance. They understand the laws of physics. They understand the laws of how the financial system of the world works and they can use it to their advantage to become rich. While a Christian is praying for God to bless him with money, that man is understanding the financial laws and becoming rich. So we have to understand that as much as there are spiritual laws that exist, there are financial laws that exist in the world. So which means if you want to be an overcomer and you want to have finances and you want to become prosperous, you can't just say, God bless me, bless me. You have to know and have the wisdom to invest in the right place. Hallelujah. We have to have the discernment, not just the spiritual discernment, but also understanding of how the world works. If you don't understand how the financial system of the world works and how money works, no matter how much you pray, you'll still be poor. Amen. So there are very good Christians with very good intentions who are broke because they have not read enough books. They have not put their mind to use to understand how things work in the world. Amen. So, come on, everybody says there are natural laws, there are spiritual laws. And life is about becoming a master of these laws that exist. But of course, the first one is what? Your understanding the spiritual laws. Amen? The advantage that we have is that we are of a different place. Amen? We were born from above. So, when we were in this world... We were living under the law of sin and death. What was the law of sin and death doing? Separating us from our source. Separating us from our father. So Jesus came and he laid down his life only to what? Pick it up again. The reason why he laid it down was he wanted to separate himself from the, the father. Once he separated himself from the father, the the law of sin and death was what? Operating on him. But only for him to what? Take it up again. And he was raised by the glory of the, the father. That was the plan, the master plan. But in between death and resurrection, something happened. What happened? Redemption happened. Amen? The redemptive work of Jesus happened between the death and resurrection. Amen? And with the resurrection, redemption was completed. And with ascension and sitting on the right hand of the throne and sending of the Holy Spirit, it was the covering of authority and power that came upon us. The Bible says, when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will teach you all things. And they received power when the Holy Spirit, what? Came upon him. Now you go back to the, the parable of uh, when Jesus says about the... Uh, prodigal son, yeah? The son who was there were two prodigal sons. One was outside, one was inside. Both didn't know the father. You know? Both sons didn't know the father. We look at this younger son as a, he went away, but there was one inside the religious system who also did not know the father because he was there doing the work of the ministry without having a relationship with the father. Yeah? So we have to understand. So there, we see the father giving the son three things, right? What was the first thing? Hmm? What's the first thing he gives? Yeah, he gives him a kiss first. Okay? <laughs> Hugs him, he kisses him, yeah? What does he do? He puts a robe of around him and then he places a ring on his hand and he throws him a party. Right? First is the embrace of the father, right? He loves us, the embrace of the father, he's kissing, he's hugging his son and expressing how much he loves him, right? And then he gives him the authority, yeah? The robe of righteousness. He takes away his dirty clothes. We see in the Old Testament when, when, when Joshua was standing there, in the realm of the spirit, he was wearing filthy robes, right? 
And the Lord told the angel to take off his filthy robes in the realm of the spirit and give him new robes. That's what's happening to this man. In the spirit, what it, what it means is that God was taking off or covering his dirtiness, his filthiness. Amen? And putting on the robe of righteousness. So now when this man is coming, you can, you can imagine how dirty and smelly he would have been, right? Just coming back to the kingdom. And people there wouldn't have noticed and, and defied him. But the father knew who he was. And he goes back and puts the robe around him. And those people who are in the palace, they can see the man coming back. And when they see the robe, they know that he's a son. Are you with me? Righteousness, not our own, but whose? We became the righteousness of? Of God. Say this with me. I became the righteousness. Oh, come on. God did not give you righteousness. He calls you righteous. There's a difference. Amen. So, which means when the people saw him, they did not see his righteousness, but they saw the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Amen. So, the Father is coming. That represents the coming of Jesus into our world, into our filth, into our unrighteousness, into our brokenness, and giving us his identity. Amen. So, when the righteousness came upon him, everybody who saw, the servants who saw, they said, mm -mm, That one is. A son, because he's wearing the robes of righteousness. Amen. Now, when he kissed him and hugged him and said, son, you are my son. Today, my son has returned. He restored back his sonship. He restored back his righteousness and dignity. Amen. And then the Bible says he put what? A ring. What does a ring signify? Authority. When a king gives a ring to somebody, it represents what? Authority. The Bible says, Zerubbabel, today I have made you my signet ring. The Bible says, what does it mean? It means that it, it's, a, it's a place and a role of authority. So when the son wore the ring of the father, he carried now the authority of the father. Hail, hallelujah. So when Jesus finished the work and he went back to the throne, he sent the Holy Spirit and the Bible says he came upon. Everybody say upon. upon. When the Holy Spirit came upon, who is the seal of righteousness for us? Who is the seal? The Holy Spirit is a seal. He is the evidence of your salvation. How do you know you're saved? Because you prayed a prayer and you said, Jesus, forgive me. No. You are saved because the evidence of the Holy Spirit is in your life. Amen. He is the seal that is upon your life. He is the mark of God upon your life. Hallelujah. There is an evidence. There is a mark. Evidential mark that is upon your life. That whatever you call and ask for, God is doing it. Why? Because there is a seal upon your life. The signet ring was in fact a seal. The signet ring, the king would just put it on the ink and then imprint it. They would pour the wax. And then once the king seals the letter with that ring, whatever document that has been sealed by that ring, everyone should obey. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But imagine that man with all the filthy robes coming and saying, hey, I'm actually the son of this house. Open the door. They were like, no. We don't recognize you. We don't know who you are. Because there is a filth upon you. There is a dirt upon you. That's what separation cost. Separation cost us to lose our identity. Separation cost us to look at the world and follow the system of the world. Hallelujah. But the moment the son came back, the father restored him to the laws of the kingdom. So now, with the signet ring, whatever documents that he now seals, the whole of the kingdom was away. Hallelujah. So when he left, he was still the son. He was still the son. But his word did not have what? Power and authority. But what changed? 
was when he came back the father gave him the authority the seal what laws do you choose to operate under will determine your success and what you do in life there are laws that exist what law do you want to operate under amen so the moment you come back you have to understand the robe of righteousness is upon you the seal of authority that is in your in your in your in your hand your identity and the bible says that the son was given what a party a banquet psalms 23 says and i shall prepare a table for you in the presence of my enemies hallelujah it means god has a way of honoring his children amen when you walk with god don't be surprised when god begins to honor you when god begins to honor you in the presence of everybody that you know amen praise the lord so as i was saying there are laws that exist in the world so when you walk in life we have to understand these laws and we have to become masters of this law and life becomes a pursuit of purpose understanding the word and growing in the knowledge of these laws check the release is a bit more yeah that's okay it's going up and down hallelujah all right now as i was saying last week there are different moves that god was trying to bring through different reformations and moves that happen in the body of christ the reason why i teach on that is because that we as a church understand different moves understand our own call and why we exist at such a time as this and how to embrace those different teachings that the it was given to the body and what do we have to offer to the next generation amen man in general yeah he is slow in understanding certain things because we don't have the holy spirit man does not have the holy spirit okay and most times even christians after a certain point get accustomed to traditions and institutions we feel safe when institutions are built okay we want to feel secure we want to feel ins- insured okay is my future safe is there insurance policy is everything insured around me is everything full uh, fail proof we want to be sure about everything so therefore when you want to go when people want to join a church they want to feel secure they want to know that you know everything is secure leaders also want everything to be secure so when god raises up a movement it starts with a lot of fire this is what we believe in but after the first generation what happens is usually people lose the vision and then it becomes an institution the very reason for which god raised that group of people or that organization they begin to lose they get sidetracked oh we can do this we can do this we can do this there are many things you can do but what is the main reason and purpose god calls us they begin to lose that okay so what happens is let's say i told last week one generation was raised to te- teach about faith another generation came they spoke about evangelism one generation came they spoke about prosperity each generation was ridiculing the other without understanding that each generation came to speak about one 
truth. And it was all for the body of Christ to receive from, to learn from, and to grow. Because these laws in the realm of the spirit are not easy for us to digest or learn and grow into right away. Okay? So God raised certain key people to teach us these laws. If those people he did not teach us about finances, we wouldn't be talking about finances today. We would be lacking in the area of the realm of finances. If those people didn't teach us faith, we would be lacking in the law of faith. If certain people didn't teach us about righteousness, we would be lacking in the area of righteousness. You with me? So every season, God was raising somebody up to teach us certain laws. And those wrote books, they preached sermons. They recorded their sermons. Thank God for that. How wonderful it would be if we have the recording of Jesus, right? Now what is this? Are you with me? We say, oh, we wish, you know, we understood what he spoke. No, everything that we need is where? Is here in the Bible. We just don't read it enough. We just don't understand the laws enough. Every law for life is where? Is here recorded in the word of God. If we look carefully, it will spark something in your spirit and it will come out of your spirit. God will use you to raise something up in your spirit. Everything that you need for life. If you just spend enough time praying in the Holy Ghost, spend enough time studying the word by the help of the Holy Spirit, he will bring those laws to surface. He will give you wisdom to analyze situations and use those laws when you require them to. Amen. And then when you have mastered it in your spirit, in the natural also, he'll give you understanding. Amen. But in the natural also, you need to read books. You can't just say, Holy Spirit, supernaturally give me wisdom how to, you know. Learn about finances or business. What you need? Now you need to go and read about business. You have to read about finances. Now you have to go read about how to fix a car if you want to be a mechanic. The best one. You can just say, okay, I'm, now I have the spirit of God. Let me just go fix a car. You will break the car. The Holy Spirit can only enhance what you already know and have. Praise the Lord. What the Holy Spirit does is what you have, the word inside of you, he can enhance it. He will enhance it. Amen? The Bible says, and when he, the Holy Spirit, come, he shall remind you of the things that I have spoken. <laughs> remind you of the things I have spoken. So how do we, in this generation, know what Jesus spoke? Everything is where? In the written word. Okay? The Logos is the word, the general word of God. Everybody say Logos. logos. What is Logos? Word. Logos is word, the word of God. It is the overall, everything, word of God. The Logos is when we read the Bible from cover to cover, you're just reading the Logos. You're just having a conversation with how many of you have had conversations you have spoken to that person for one hour two hours but suddenly one thing in that conversation struck you hit your spirit and you said you know what that one word changed my life that one moment changed my life that is what Rama is like when God begins to speak specifically to a situation it is becoming what Rama what is Rama it becomes the spoken word. It becomes the word that God spoke to you personally. It becomes the word that uplifted you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also quicken. But the Bible says what? Quicken your mortal body. That word when it comes, it quickens you. That is the rhema that caused you to become born again. Everybody say born again. You were born again not of the corruptible but of the incorruptible seed of God's word which means at one moment boom there's something that entered you you became born again what was it it was not a ritual 
Nobody dumped you in the water and said, be born again. It was a moment of knowing. It was a moment of understanding. Hallelujah. It was a spiritual law that was at work. Amen. It was a spiritual law that was at work. So now that spiritual law caused you to be born again. You have now entered into a spiritual realm as a spirit being. Everybody say, I am a spirit. I am a spirit. In a body. And I have a soul. I operate in the realm of the spirit. But I live in the flesh. You see, so your, your, your flesh can touch, it can feel, it can sense. Your soul understands the natural laws. But you are also coexisting parallelly in the realm of the spirit. Which means you see through the eyes of your spirit, you see through your eyes. Vision. You see and prophesy. And you speak words of wisdom at work. You can't go and prophesy to your boss. Right? Can you? But you can speak wisdom. You can't do prophetic. Why are you? What are you doing? I'm doing a prophetic move right now in the office. They will fire you. You do that in the church and the outside. When you go there, you act with wisdom. Hallelujah. Are you understanding me? You're living in both worlds, what? Parallelly. Jesus was walking, but he says, whatever I see my father do, I'm doing. He was operating both in the natural and in the spiritual. Hallelujah. And that was made possible because of the death of Jesus. You died to the law of sin and death. Now when law of sin and death operates, law of life will not operate. Okay? So when law of sin and death are there, Jesus redeemed us from that. Right? From the law of sin and death. When he redeemed us from the law of sin and death, when he redeemed us from the law of sin and death, we now enter into a new arena. What is that? The law of what is the what is the law that we entered into? Law of yeah, law of everybody say law of, law of. spirit of, spirit of. Life. life. What's the opposite law? Law of sin and death. He redeemed us through his death. When he resurrected, we resurrected. Now, a new law is at work. The law of spirit of life. Now, there are many laws that operate. There is a law of fear. But there is a law of faith. The law of faith says, we are saved by what? Faith and faith and faith alone, not by works. Religion, institution, that's why I'm, I'm coming there. Why do we feel safe in an institution? Pastor, tell us what to do, we'll do, we'll feel safe. Don't tell me to go and read the Bible, pray and take a step of faith and live by faith. I'm afraid. Many people don't do that. Why? Because they want to feel safe. I went to church. I worshipped. I listened to sermon. I went home. I prayed. I'm a good Christian. Pastor prophesied to me and tell me what to do next. I don't want to take the risk of stepping out by faith. So an institution is a safe place for people. Why? Because they come, they learn, two steps to salvation, three steps to finances, 
and then step three how to live everything is all in your book you know what's how to read read, read the book there is no relationship there is no stepping out by faith that is being built when it happens are you with me so when you become an institutionalized way of looking things what happens is from relationship we step into tell me how to do it and i will do it but life of faith is not oh i'll follow these steps and then you know god will bless me if i do this then god will heal me no that's not the way it works you have to be in the spirit it is a genuine life it's an authentic life it is a life where the life of god begins to flow in you it begins to flourish you it becomes to help you thrive and then you come to a place and you begin to operate by faith that's why a lot of people they think they're living by faith oh see he told me about faith so i'm going to do it and the same thing is going to happen it won't happen that's why the sons of skiva said the in the name of jesus who paul preaches it doesn't work just because your pastor does just because your friend does it you have to have a real encounter with this jesus you have to have a real encounter with this faith everything that you want to operate in power you need to have the release of the rema without that anointing without that rema that's being released to you that faith that the word of faith will not work that healing will not work it has to come from within you There are times that I prayed for somebody. There's a pastor, please pray for the healing. I prayed. Nothing happened. And there were times when the Rema word came and the Bible said, as the Rema word came to me, the Holy Spirit said, go and help, hold the hand and raise them up. The lady rose up. Paralyzed, gone. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning. I said, Lord, I want to understand the depths of your Rema so that every time I pray, it comes from the depth of my spirit oh pastor you pray nothing happened come on let it become reality to you we are all on a journey amen, amen. are you getting me that's why recently i read the news somewhere like they, some child got sick and they didn't give medicine because they believe god will raise her that's foolishness are you doing it because of enthusiasm and 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 out of your passion of your heart or are you doing it because you have a revelation you with me it must come from a place of rema it must come from a place of revelation now it, it, it should not come from a place of an institution it should not come from a place of religion religion has no place in the life of a christian amen it must come from a place of an authentic real relationship with god So when the Bible says that reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus you need to understand that it is not just symbolically speaking you have to put yourself there I am dead to sin why because Jesus died Amen I was part of that death I was part of his resurrection and then now the life that I live I live I live in the spirit Now let's go to chapter 7 verse 7 okay or do you not okay let's go from chapter 6 verse mm-hmm. 22 Romans chapter 6 verse 22 are you there yeah. but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life look at that you have been set free from sin and you have become slaves of god okay you have your fruit to 
holiness. Now, when the Bible says slaves to God, he is not saying that God is your master. What he's saying is it's a life of service to God where you are indebted. You're like, you're, 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 you're just surrendered completely to him, to the master. Amen. It's a life where you're like, I am sold out to you, Jesus. But he's not a master whose yoke is heavy. His yoke is light. <clears throat> Paul is speaking in that language because of showing his dedication and his surrender to God. Hallelujah. Where was he? Yeah, slaves of God. You have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting <coughs> life. Verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Sin brought separation, that brought death. Why did it bring death? Because sin is what? Separation. And when you time you're separated from the source, you die. You take the plant out of the soil, the plant dies. You take the fish out of the water, the fish die. You take a man out of the presence of God, separated from the Father, the original garden, you die. Eden. Everybody's looking for Eden. Why is there no Eden on earth? Because, let me explain something to you. Eden, more than a physical place, was an atmosphere. You know how they show in the cartoons, there was like a, you know, a small garden and then they were there. Oh, they were whole earth. And they were in a place, they were in a home. You know where my Eden is? There's my Eden. My shop is my Eden. My home is my Eden. What am I doing? I'm growing in the presence of God. I'm increasing in my capacity to influence. I'm bringing the kingdom everywhere. Hallelujah. Do you get me? When you go home and you're in your little room, it's your Eden. When you're praying, you're praising. Wherever you walk, wherever you set your domain is your Eden. You are increasing your capacity to influence. You start a Bible study in your house, that's your Eden. The presence of God is Eden. It's not a physical place. So no matter how much they search, they will not find it. Amen. And when man was taken out of Eden, it was out of the presence of God. He began to walk under and work under the laws that govern the physical. Once he chose that, now he had to toil. He had to sweat. There was problem. There was hatred. There was jealousy. There was envy. And all the things that he should not be feeling, he started to feel and he began to give into because the law of spirit of life was not at work in him. But certain men looked into their hearts and said, hey, there is also goodness in us. And these were the good seeds that God was looking at. Some were men who were capable of great evil. Some men were sheep who were capable of good. So Abel was one of them. Unfortunately, he got killed. Then Seth came. And out of him came Noah. And Noah had three sons. Out of which two were good. One was. And out of Shem came the Semites, the Israelites, to Abraham from the area of Mesopotamia. But his father was not a righteous man. But Abraham had the capacity to believe. God saw it. I said, that man has a capacity. I'm going to try and reach out to him. And when God did, he responded. And he believed. And it was credited to him as righteousness. And God said, I'm going to prophesy to you. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. 
So Abraham now had the capacity to operate under a spiritual law and become a nation that would bring the Messiah who will die and bring us into a new spiritual law of life and life in the spirit. Spirit of life. Amen. So now the laws of nature, the laws of everything, the spirit, all the negative laws are trying to oppose this law of life to come. The bloodline was very important. That's why Satan was always trying to kill the bloodline. Abel, Joseph. You see, whenever there was a call, there was an oppression that came upon that person. They had to fight all odds to come to the place of purpose that God had for them in the spirit. Amen. Jesus, when he was born, what happens? All the boys his age, around that time, Herod killed. Moses was one such person. Before he was born, the Pharaoh said, all the boys thrown into the Nile. But God judged it. Where? And all the firstborn died and when they crossed the Red Sea all the sons of Egypt were covered by the Red Sea Amen but what happened death was trying to swallow them up out of the water they came out of death into life whatever goes into the water dies and comes out alive that's why Jesus had to go to river now to the river of Jordan to die and to rise up again. Amen. The life in the spirit will not happen until you die to your self. The life in the spirit cannot happen until you come to the place of total surrender and say, I am a slave of God. Amen. All right. And then you now begin to have the fruit to holiness and the end is everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now let's move. Chapter 7, yes. Romans chapter 7. Verse 21. Are you there in verse 21? 721? Yeah. I then find a law. Paul is saying, I then find a, a law. Mm, that is a law. That evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, which is the spirit. But I see another law in my members, where warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my member. You see, Oh, but there is an inward man who wants to do good. But there is a law that is in my flesh that does not allow me to do good. Verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus. Who will deliver me? He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of, of sin. So there is a law that is constantly working to, to, to bring you to sin, but there is a law of in the spirit that wants to do good. Amen. See, all these things are happening, but I thank God that through Christ Jesus, with my mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Therefore, is there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now, what institution will make you do is make you walk in the flesh. What is walking in the flesh? See, walking in the flesh is not 
all the sins that you commit. Walking in the flesh is you thinking that going to church will make me a righteous person. Thinking reading the Bible will make me a righteous person. Thinking that if I do good, I'm a righteous person. That is you walking in the flesh. But walking in the spirit is understanding the law of faith. Understanding law of of the spirit of life that is working in me through Christ Jesus. How do you understand it? You understand it through revelation, through Rema. You became born again, not because of what you did, but because of your understanding of what Jesus did. You became born again, not of the corruptible, but of the incorruptible seed of God's word. You are not coming to a physical place, but this is holy city, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. We are building a, a city which was not built by the hands of any man, but by God himself. Many members, but one body. Building to himself, one man in Christ Jesus. Nothing physical, you see? There is nothing physical about it. We do build things in the physical, but we are coming from a place of the spirit. And when we operate like that, in the natural, also things begin to work. Amen. So there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk who do not who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But if I now ask you, are you righteous? Are you the righteousness of God? Are you a sinner? What do you say? Why do you say you are the righteousness of God? Because in your spirits, that you know there is there is a law that is working in your flesh to do bad things, but you know that you are saved because of your spirit. You do not now live according to the flesh you now live according to the spirit you do not now live according to what you feel you now live according to what you know and believe amen you do not live oh but, 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 but i committed a mistake so i'm a sinner no i'm the righteousness of god through christ jesus because of what i know there is a law that is working against me in my flesh. But if you give attention to that law, that law will reign and rule over your life. But if you pay attention to what Jesus has done to your spirit, there is a law. Everybody said there is a law. There is a law that is working in your spirit. And that law is what? Law of life. Hallelujah. There is a law of life that is working in your spirit. Therefore, now there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life. Ooh. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free. Everybody say has made me free. There is a law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Paul is saying, yes, there is a law that is working in my flesh, but the law of spirit of life has set me free. So when you make a mistake, you're not sitting down there crying, weeping, and saying, God, please forgive me. You now switch over and see in your spirit, the law of spirit of life has set you free. So because it has set you free, you say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Everybody say, there's a law. Yes, there is a law working in my spirit. Amen. How do you tap into the law? And we said knowledge. knowledge. Revelation, Rema. Rema is true. A lot of people just they just read, 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 read the Bible without having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So they do not know the deep understanding of who they are. So they're separated still. They're in the house. Like I said in the, the parable. They're in the house. Oh, look at him. He went out. He did all the bad things. I'm here in the church. I'm such a good boy. I'm such a good girl. I never committed any sin in my life. Oh, look at me. But you don't know the father. When the father came, how dare you throw a party for that sinner? The father said, do you not understand that all that I have is for you also. You never threw a party for me. The father was like, what do you mean? Everything I have is yours, which means you can take what I have. You are expecting me to do something for you. Why was he doing it in the first place? Can I tell you why? Pastor, I did this, I did this, I did this, but nobody noticed me. You never said a word and said, Oh, well done, my good and faithful servant. 
Are you with me? Say this with me. Do not work. Do not serve for the accolades of man. You don't need anyone to tell you. Even if God doesn't tell you, you need to know it by faith. That is already yours. That's the kind of life we need to live. And of course, we need to be appreciative. We need to be appreciative and say, hey, good job. All that is important. But that is not the reason why I work. If I begin to live a life like that, I'm living in the flesh. See, I am doing these things so that he can... No, I don't need that. You are my reward. Hallelujah. I, I, even if he doesn't do anything for me, I'm just going to worship. Oh, I've prayed so much. I've done so much, but you didn't give my healing. Oh, I did all this, but you didn't give my financial breakthrough. That's the reason you're not getting a financial breakthrough. Because you, from the first, you did that so that he will give something to you. But me, how should I live? How should you live? Is a life where I'm just going to do it. Not expecting anything in return from him. Amen. But when I come to the place of sonship, everybody says sonship. When you come to the place of sonship, you're not waiting and saying, Papa, please give me something. When you come to the place of sonship, Dad, I'm taking me, son. I'm taking a bottle. Okay, bye. Father, yeah, sure. There's a difference. You understand? Of course, without sonship, you can't go and say, you're not mature enough to handle. You understand? But you're not mature. You're doing everything. Busy body. Papa, say, say something about me. You know why we do that? Because we have deep traumas inside. We want people to notice us and tell us we're good. And when we don't feel appreciated, we get hurt. For a long time, I had a hurt in my heart. Because for a long time, my father never noticed me and appreciated me. My own physical father. So growing up, I always longed for his approval. So I started looking for approval outside. So my friends, uh, will they accept me? Will they approve me? I didn't. You know when my father started giving me approval? Maybe I was 25 years old. Before that, I never heard my father give any approval. He would say, you can do better. So there was some disconnect there. Where, because that generation was like that. And sometimes parents can be like that. So I began to look at God and ask, started seeking for approval. But when I started knowing the Holy Spirit and started knowing who I am and whose I am, I stopped looking for approval and I started living life in the Spirit. And when I began to live life in the Spirit, I did not care. You gave me approval or not, I don't care. You like me or not, I don't care. What I live for is I live for His glory. Hallelujah. Then when you go into sonship, there is a confidence that comes into your heart. God will heal you of all those things that you feel. I'm not saying everybody will go through the same. I mean, I'm sharing my own personal experience. Maybe you had wonderful parents who, are, who, who loved you and gave you roses every time you did something. Amazing. Praise God for that. Maybe you have parents... Who did not notice you or appreciate you. The first time that I ever felt that somebody loved me was when Jesus. My, my parents loved me, but they were not expressive. You see? Not expressive. So I did not get that expressive love. I'm a very. So growing up also, I began, I began to grow like that, not very expressive. Up to now, I'm not very expressive. In the way, but I'm, I'm improving. I'm improving. But at least I, I confess, I tell my wife, I'm not very, I'm not very expert. I need to work on it. Because 25 years of my life, I grew up like that. So it's hard for me to express love in a certain way. You see? So my wife is different on the other hand. She's so amazing. Amazing. Her parents who express love. So she can just express her love for me. 
in a very amazing way. And I can just be like, yeah. <laughs> but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Hallelujah. So everything that we go through began to affect us the way we are. And then the reason I'm sharing this with you, it affects the way we look at God. We look at ministry. We look at the faith. We look at the church. It begins to affect us. But thanks be to God. Hallelujah. He begins to heal us. Deep down, he begins to heal us. Amen. Say this with me. Live life in the spirit. Now when we live life in the spirit now, so what all these things will make us to live life in the flesh. So when I look to the father, when I see my earthly father, I look at my heavenly father and think he's like that. I look at my spiritual father and think he's like that. So when I saw my spiritual father, why God gave me a spiritual father? My spiritual father was different. He began to take me into the things that my earthly father could never take me into. My spiritual father began to show me certain things on my spiritual, my earthly father. My earthly father is wonderful. God healed him also of many things. We all learned, we grew, we grew, we grew as a family. But when I saw my spiritual father, my spiritual father took me into another realm of faith that my earthly parents couldn't. They brought me into this world, but I needed someone else to take me to the next level. That's what I saw my spiritual father. I said, hey. and I said, no, I humbled myself before him and I began to learn from him and began to grow. Call him from time to time and say, Papa, this is what I'm going through. This is what is happening. Keep him updated. So he prays for me and I come under that anointing and grace. Amen. So life in the spirit is different. Life in the flesh. Oh, I was hurt. I went through this. I went through that. How long are you going to be complaining? I complained for a long time. But then I began to come into the life of spirit. I said, you know what? I don't want to complain anymore. I can choose to complain for the rest of my life and stay in the same place. Or I can choose to make a difference and say, you know what? God, you have given me a choice to live in the spirit. You have given me a choice to live by faith. I choose this. Or I'm going to hold on to the hurt and the pain. It is a choice. If you work enough in the spirit, God will transform old as within you. Take away the old. Bring the new. Amen. If you live in the spirit, or your, your past will disappear. The freshness of life will come. Amen. If you live in the spirit, the law of sin and death, it has been, it has been clawing at you, taking, trying to take away your joy. But the more and more you live in the spirit, it will lose its grip over your life. Slowly, slowly. It won't happen right away, but slowly, slowly, you will feel the grip of depression, the grip of anxiety, the grip of fear, the grip of timidity just loosing its grip on you and God's life just swallowing you up, covering you up. Amen. Verse 3, chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled.